I don't do a lot of product reviews on my YouTube channel, but occasionally there's something that I think is worth um, bringing up in case somebody else is wondering about it. And um, I have a vintage computer project that's going to require me to desolder a whole bunch of IC sockets in a in a RAM bank, and uh, in order to put new sockets in because the sockets have gone bad and are unreliable. And I didn't look forward to doing it with my usual desoldering tool, which is one of these things. These are really good, but they're intended for onesie twosie kind of desoldering operations. Um, <clears throat> so I decided it was time to bite the bullet and buy a proper desoldering station. There are actually quite a few of them out there, but most of them are quite expensive, and then there are some that are really pretty crummy too. I didn't want to go broke on it, but I wanted something that would do the job and wouldn't be a total turkey, you know. <laughs> it doesn't have to be professional quality, but it needs to be decent. Um, I actually found this one based on a review that Dave Jones of the EEV blog um, did on a differently branded version of this. He was uh, reviewing one that is uh, supposedly made by a company in Australia. I forget the name of it, but um, in the course of that I found that these are made under different names. This particular one, it's got the brand name of Mimotronics, or at least that's the selling distributor and the, the only name that's in the manual. Uh, the front of the product doesn't say Mimotronics, nor does the label on the back. Um, but it's clear these are made in some factory and then sold under different names. Um, this is a proper desoldering station. You don't use it for soldering, uh, although you could in a pinch. Um, it's not got an ideal tip for it, but if you just had some large pad and you didn't have a soldering iron, this would allow you to melt solder onto a pad and, and, and do the trick, but nothing fine. No fine work, no small uh, pads would work with it, probably. Anyway, so a desoldering station is basically built like a soldering iron, except that it also has a powerful vacuum pump in it. And you end up with a, uh, a gun or an iron. This particular one uses the gun shape. Uh, I have seen ones that are just built more like a regular soldering pencil. Uh, you have a chamber in here. You can possibly see there's already some solder blasted against the felt filter in there from some desoldering I've already done. Uh, basically you've got the tip. It's heated up conventionally and unlike a regular soldering iron it's got a small hole at the end. Um, this particular uh, product does come with three different tips having different size holes in the end, although the tips themselves are the same size as far as I can tell. Um, <clears throat> just like any other soldering iron, you would unscrew this knurled ring there to release this uh, outer sheath, and then the tip would be released, and inside you'd find the sensing element and the heating element. Uh, but because it's hollow, it goes through into this chamber and all the solder that's sucked out gets blasted up against this plate and then the air goes through the felt filter and uh, out the flexible hose. One of these is the electrical cord for the heating element, the other one is the suction hose. <coughs> and down at this end you end up with the uh, plug for the electrical and this has not only the wires for the heating element, but the wires for the temperature sensor and also wires for the motor of the suction uh, pump. So if I take this off, we'll look at it. It's in there pretty good. So this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we assume two of those are the switch for the motor and two more are the heating element, then that leaves three more which would be the typical number of wires for an RTD temperature sensor, which is probably what they're using. So um, that is unpluggable. And then over here you've got the vacuum hose coming in. 
Now really to do this you need to pull the hose off um, because otherwise there's too much spring and you can't turn this enough to unscrew it. But what you find inside of there is a, another uh, felt filter in case something escapes the filter in the gun and gets through the hose. It doesn't go into the pump. So primary and secondary filter elements. The controls are very simple. Power switch on and off, a Celsius Fahrenheit selector button, and then up and down, which just changes the desired temperature of the heating element. And it has a dual display, which I'll show in a moment, which basically tells you if the heating element is on or off. It'll tell you what the target temperature is you've set and what the actual measured temperature is, and usually they're within a degree or two of each other. Um, the product is actually quite lightweight. I don't know the exact weight, but it's uh, not heavy. There's no big transformer in here or anything. The case is plastic, although it seems to be reasonably well built. It almost looks like it's metal, but it's just got that texture like uh, painted metal. Um, the front is definitely uh, plastic. The window here is one of the cheapest things. It looks about as good as a, a window on a windshield of a plastic airplane model. I've seen much nicer looking windows, but again. And by the way, this product, uh, I purchased it on Amazon. I think it was around $160, which is way better than the next best thing I found, which was maybe $500. Uh, going back around the other side, you've got the holder for the uh, the gun and it has a uh, high temperature shroud on it and then the rest of its metal. I heard some other reviewers say this whole thing was plastic and that it would break off very easily. I found this to be it's not really thick metal but at least it's metal and you can detach it from the base by pulling up on it but I'm not going to do that right at this point. It does stick into a hole there. Now if you wiggle this back and forth you could probably snap that off but under normal use I think it'd be okay. Comes with a little uh, sponge just like a soldering iron to clean the tip and by pushing back on the holder it comes loose and it can be freestanding. There is no uh, similar set of slotted holes on the other side so if you're going to dock it to the um, the base unit it must be on the right side. Not so good for left-handed people who want to have it docked. The rear of the unit's very plain. It lists power as 140 watts. Um, I'm presuming that's the incoming power but it doesn't really make it clear. It says the gun itself is 80 watts. Uh, input voltage is 110 to 130 so it is not universal voltage. It's 60 Hertz only. I don't know if they make versions of this for sale in other countries with different voltages or frequencies. It's got a 3.15 amp fuse somewhere, but it's not out here. At least not with a standalone fuse holder. I don't know if it's visible in this or not, but you can see the, uh, the back bow when I'm trying to pull the plug out. It's not all that sturdy. Oh, I'm sorry. So there is a fuse holder as part of the IEC power plug. So yeah, you don't have to take it apart to change the fuse. Before I go into the inside of it, the tool also comes with three uh, pokers that are basically cleaning tools of different diameters for the three different size holes and the three available tips. Um, my camera's probably not going to show these very clearly, but they're like little rat tail files. Again, not real easy to see, but that's in case the tip does get plugged, you can ream it out with those. And the kit also comes with two more tips. They're not really replacement tips, they're tips with different size holes in them for different um, leads that you might want to stick it over when you're desoldering pads on a circuit board. It has three of the high usage filters uh, as replacements for the one in the gun and then the backup filter that goes uh, up by the front of the unit here there's one replacement felt for that presumably that doesn't need to be replaced so often. 
So that's what comes with the, the product. If I remove two screws here and two on each side, then the uh, main part of the case cover comes off. Uh, and as I mentioned, the case is plastic, so it's not real strong, but once it's all screwed into place, it's strong enough. Uh, the IEC plug is snapped into the case and it's hot melted in to reinforce it, hot melt glue is used. I think the case is too flexible and that jack would pop out of there if it didn't have that glue. I always worry when glue is used on a product like this as part of the structure. Uh, the front is you know, wobbly without the case attached to it, but it's okay. Uh, one nice thing is, you know, this is one of the marks between something that's really cheap and something that's only partially cheap. At least they put captive nuts into the plastic here so the machine screws that hold it in place can be used and you can take it in and out many times without it stripping out. Um, a cheaper product would just put little uh, sheet metal screws and screw them into plastic and after you take those out two or three times they're stripped out and they won't hold anymore so they at least did that. The bottom is held in with uh, screws through the bottom and uh, looks like lock nuts. The bottom of the case is stamped sheet metal, so that part is, is metal. Um, this big structure here is clearly some sort of switching power supply for the heating element. And uh, I'm not bothered I'm not gonna bother to take that apart, but it almost looks like just from the mounting on here that it's some generic a uh, heating element or uh, some sort of generic power supply that was intended to be mounted some other way and then they stuck it in this way. Um, so it doesn't really look like it was purpose built for this product. On the front, besides the power switch and the electrical jack down there, you've got two circuit boards. One of them just holds the three push buttons and it's just a base for those. And then you've got the circuit board which is obviously the controller and the uh, LCD display and the backlight is all on there. In Dave Jones's review um, he didn't know what this black plastic thing is and neither do I. <laughs> it has two sets of wires coming out of it. One set of wires um, let's see, it's a black wire and a white wire and who knows where they go. And then another set of wires which are these gray wires and they sort of disappear into the wiring harness. But it looks like at least one of them goes to the motor. So this might be some sort of a small circuit to help control the motor. Uh, so, you know, maybe it is exactly that. Maybe it's got a relay in it or a little uh, DC power supply or something. But anyway, it's zip tied on. There's a, Obviously it wasn't intended to be mounted to this power supply as a native design. So you've got a big DC motor, fairly beefy one here, and then you've got uh, the actual vacuum pump assembly, which is made out of pretty heavy metal here. It looks fairly robust. Um, I don't know which type of technology they use in there. I'm not going to take it apart to find out, but you can see it's a gasket sealed and um, it must provide a fairly good suction to draw the solder uh, the way it does. So whatever it is, it's got a per fairly beefy motor and this big heavy assembly. The uh, incoming airline from the gun it's too hard to see here clearly, but it immediately comes in and snakes down underneath this uh, vacuum pump and then goes into the pump. And then I'm not really sure what happens with the rest of it, but there's another hose that goes this way and it seems like on this end it just goes back in the other end. So I don't know, maybe this is a two-stage pump. You know, maybe it comes in here, goes through once, and then wraps around and goes through again, and then exits with this little um, elbow here, and then apparently just blasts the air into the bottom of the case. So I'm not really sure what that is. I'm 
my story is going to be it's a double stage vacuum pump uh, connected in series. Um, I'm sticking with that story even if it's not true. If somebody knows better, let me know. Uh, so let's see, there's really not much more to report on this. It's fairly simple inside. Build quality seems decent, if not great. And on the subject of captive nuts, there aren't any for the four screws on the bottom. They're only used for the ones on the top. And that's because it's plastic up there, but these screws on the sides go through into the sheet metal base, so those are just tapped holes in the sheet metal that the screws go into. So that's okay. Okay, so turning the unit on, it is green backlit. That's version 03 of the firmware it flashed very briefly. I've got it set to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. It seems like it does some boot up because it doesn't try to increase the temperature immediately. It sits there for, I don't know, 10-15 seconds or something and then it starts kicking on the power and raising the temperature. So it's it's not there immediately but you can see it's catching up on it fairly quickly. The maximum temperature on this is somewhat higher. I think it may get up around 850 degrees or so. I can change it to Celsius at the touch of a button if I prefer that. Back to Fahrenheit. Um, so heat on is indicating that it's trying to heat and white is just an indication that the two don't match as if you couldn't tell that on your own. It's possible the white indicator might come on for some other reason but the manual says it comes on when it's not achieved its set temperature. be there shortly. Alright, there we are. It overshoots a little bit, it'll back it down. So just for um, illustration I'm going to unsolder a few holes on this old circuit board to kind of show how it works. That's the noise it makes by the way when you're turning it on. And that's just done by squeezing the trigger. So uh, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to start with the second hole. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus. So that's probably enough of that for one moment. But um, you can see that it has sucked the solder out of the holes. And um, I could drop that socket out of there now if I did the rest. Uh, in the few experiments I've done so far, it's very rare that the that there is enough solder left to actually hold a, a lead in place. There is a technique that is best followed and that's actually to use the hole on the end and put it down over the lead and then as soon as you can see the solder starting to flow push the trigger to start sucking and just move in a very slight rotating pattern. I'm going to do it for this one here. Ah! 
that helps get the solder out of the side where the lead is pushing against the side of the hole and maybe it doesn't want to remove the solder there but by making that motion it lets the air flow on all sides of the lead and therefore you get a truly solder free hole and uh, it's very easy. Now you can actually go much faster than I showed it. You know it's um, just like that. So you can make pretty quick work of it. And once again all that solder that's been sucked in is plastered to the back of this. The uh, specifications on the tips are the hole sizes 0.75 millimeter, 0.94 millimeter, and 1.25 millimeter. Here's the information on the supplier Mimotronics.com. There's their phone number in case you're interested. The product has what they call an auto tip saver function where if you haven't used it uh, about in 15 minutes uh, it'll ramp the temperature down to uh, a much lower level so it's not sitting there cooking and then all you have to do is tap any of the three buttons on the front and it'll immediately uh, uh, return to its uh, set temperature. It may take a few seconds but that's all it takes to wake it up at least. So the book seems to be pretty good. I'm surprised at the manual. It looks like it was not written in Chinglish. Um, so here's a diagram of changing the the tip. There's the heater element, there's the inner sheath, the tip, the knurled nut, and the outer sheath. So it's very conventional. There's a technique for cleaning the solder capture chamber which is this. Basically, um, you first press this black part in, you pull it down, and then you pull it back. So I've already started to move the, the uh, breech, as they call it. It's a matter of almost like re moving the barrel of a, uh, a gun. You push it in with your thumb to take the pressure off the latch, and then that little black knob is the latch. Once that's uh, released, then the breech will slide back. Once the breech is back, the uh, glass chamber can be pulled back and released at the front like you can see that there. Anyway, by pulling the chamber out entirely, then it's uh, possible to open the chamber up and clean the accumulated solder out and change that uh, felt filter. Anyway, since I'm not doing that now, I just snap the breech back in place. Actually, the manual is quite good. It's written clearly. It's got adequate pictures and photos. Talks about cleaning a clogged tip, routine tip cleaning. Uh, if you have poor vacuum, different methods of solving that. Looks like it's pretty well written. Uh, the specifications are, uh, as noted before, now this will say 110 to 130 volts or 220 to 240, but my particular unit only mentions the lower voltages so apparently they make different versions of this product for different regions. The gun is uh, operated at 24 volts 80 watts. The product dimensions are 18 centimeters wide, 16 centimeters high, and uh, 16 centimeters deep. Not including the AC power cord or the gun the temperature ranges from 160 degrees C to 480 degrees C, which is 320 Fahrenheit to 896 Fahrenheit. Static vacuum level, 23 centimeters of mercury, and uh, 75 dB at 1 meters distance sound level from the pump. It has all the parts here, which are available from Mimotronics. Words of caution. Anyway, so... I'm quite pleasantly surprised with this product. Oh, look at this. This manual designed and co-authored by John Wiltrout. So, definitely not some Chinese guy. Although I have no doubts that this product is itself engineered and designed and manufactured in China or uh, somewhere on the Western Pacific. But it seems to be a pretty decent product at a reasonable price point. 
with decent performance seems to be reasonably well thought out. Um, I don't know if this manual is offered by other companies selling this product, the ZD985, or if that's just something that Mematronics uh, has produced for this product. That's quite possible. Maybe if you buy it from other suppliers, it may not have such a good manual. Anyway, kudos to these guys for providing that. Somebody's put some effort into it. So um, that's my overview and little review of this uh, product. Hopefully that helps you out.